And the next talk is given by Professor Mailender from uh, Mainz concerning unsolved problems in cancer and future aspects. Thank you very much. Um, so first I would like to thank Bayat, Professor Hunziger, for inviting me and for giving the opportunity to give you some thoughts what's going on <clears throat> in cancer therapy. Unsolved problems in, can in cancer and future aspects, well, I could name several, several hundreds, I would even say, but I only, I only chose to, do, to give you three of them. Um, I myself, by training, I'm a medical doctor, working in hematology, oncology, and also in transfusion medicine. And uh, about 13 years ago, I was going to work with nanoparticles for that reason. Now I'm not its nanoparticles mostly come from, from the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Mainz. Yeah, so what did I choose here? I chose two technical problems and one more social problem. The one is targeting. We want to target our nanocarriers. We need to release stuff out of that. And at least we need to collaborate uh, between different teams for that. Why, they, why, why, do, why was nanoparticles and nanocarriers, why were they so intimately um, connected to the field of uh, cancer? Well, first in class, first in man stuff, that was actually doxyl in my view. At least that was when, uh, what, uh, what I was first introduced to nanotechnology with. So it's packaging an old drug and all, giving you all the side effects, new indications, new possibilities to treat your patients. But also on the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic uh, side, we have MRI contrast agents with, uh, with superparamagnetic iron oxide particles showing us the liver metastasis. We have a new, newly complete mode of new action. So nanotechnology actually promises to have a significantly enhanced and altered pharmacokinetic to alter side effects and even to alter modes of action and to give you an intelligent targeted package of drugs. So has this been fulfilled? Well, a lot of people are working, uh, working towards it. We have a lot of publications out there, 12,000, 13,000 papers dealing, uh, calling it nanomedicine. And when you look here at 2003, for example, there were only three to four papers that were naming, that, that coined uh, nanomedicine as a special, specific field. So products have been coming into, or have been reaching the clinic uh, I've named two of them, albumin is a newer uh, drug delivery device. Of course, there are more to them than that, but still, none of them is really targeted. So how can we target? And Kenneth Dawson has, a few years ago, has pointed us to the importance of protein corona. And he has basically what he said, protein absorption will mask whatever you put on the surface. So you will have absorption of proteins that will just mask uh, your targeting moiety. So can we still do targeting? Can we have cellular uptake that's not um, uh, mastered by the proteins absorbed? Or can we even use that? And can we use different biodistribution? Can we influence biodistribution still by targeting? I think this was very, yeah, that was an open question at that time. So when we looked into, uh, I wanted to give you also the uh, glimpse of solution where we can look at. Um, so when you look, how do you avoid uh, protein absorption. Then you, then you see in the literature you use polyethylene, poly, polyethylene glycol for that in most cases. So, uh, and polyethylene glycol should not then absorb proteins anymore. But if you do the following, if you just take peculated particles in yellow here, put no protein into your cell culture and you still find uptake, interestingly. So what's going on? Well, you still find some proteins on them and it turns out there's, there are specific proteins absorption. They will then make the difference. They, and if you then look, we can now define which proteins these are, and clustering seems to be a very good uh, candidate for that. Polyethylene glycol and also other uh, stealth uh, polymers, they absorb this specific protein, and this gives, you, uh, this gives you the ability to shield it from unspecific uptake, so we should have enabled targeting, and you can see that we can do that at least in cell culture, on a cell culture level, even in 100% serum with an easy and small molecule manose here. So, but still in, in, uh, in, the, in the body, it doesn't work too well, in animals, in humans. And why is that? Why can't we treat tumors so well? Well, Tuan Lamas has been pointing us to one specific problem in that, and that is that we, have, we, we only have evasion of the uh, of the nanocarriers to the first row of uh, cancer cells. The last rows of cancer cells will never see a nanoparticle and will never have the chance to take it up or to, that uh, the drug will be released there. So how, 
Can we do that if we can't detect it directly? Let's do it indirectly. Let's use the immune system. Dendritic cells are a very good target for nanoparticles. They take it up. They educate the uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes and other cells to attack the tumor. And then uh, we have even uh, an enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, visibility for that. Active targeting by antibodies ligands is not even needed for dendritic cells, at least not in cell culture, and you will get also find uh, that uh, in, in animals. And you have a multiplication effect by using the killer cells. You also find the, also your uh, immune system will find metastasis your nanocarriers may never find. And we can do combination with other uh, modalities that, are, that have proven to be effective in the last years, for example, NDPD1 antibodies. So now we've come to the cell, and why should we care for release? Well, if you think of that we want to educate our, our dendritic cell to show the T cell what, uh, what it should look at in the body, we need, to have, uh, we need to have the antigen taken up. And what we don't want, we don't want to have it uh, in the lysosome where it's only amino acids. We want to have it actually here at that place where we want to have the peptide shuttle out from the endosome, um, shuttle into the endoplasmatic reticulum, into the Golgi, load it onto the MHC complex, then present it to these T cells so that we have got the Im immune effect out of it. People call it, immunologists call that pr cross presentation, which is a hard thing, and a lot of people have been working on that. How can we decipher where, where these particles are? And one thing def definitely is high resolution uh, microscopy, as you have just seen, but where do we know which proteins we need to tag? And that could be done uh, like that. You have a magnetic nanoparticle, you feed it to the cell, you uh, disrupt the cell, uh, do a magnetic separation. And here you see that we really get, can get back the, the endosomes. And then you f the, uh, by mass spectrometry, you can identify a whole set of proteins, some of them enriched. Of course, you have too many. Now you do bioinformatics. Look what uptake pathways and intracellular pathways you use. And then microscopy molecular biology comes in place and tells you if that's true what you found here, because you will need to va validate all that. So switching to the last thing, collaboration. I think we, we collaborate uh, well on, on, a, on a European level, on a national level. We have quite some programs there. But we should not, uh, we should not uh, um, we should also collaborate very well with our collaborators in the, um, in the, in the, in the same university, because I think most of the papers that, we, uh, that were published here, they were working together with one group, and they, so they didn't make it to the other side. Why is that important? Because understanding a complex system like neurocarriers, and an even more complex system like the, the human body, will need us to decipher different mechanisms. And these nerve mechanisms are on the cellular level, on the molecule or subcellular level, as I've just shown you, and also on the or organ level, on the organism level. Only then we will be able to get into application medicine, and then pharma industry can pick up our ideas and develop it into a clinical study. So when I started working in 2003, I thought, well, it's good enough if you just work for medicine and maybe have some partners uh, in chemistry and phys uh, pharmacy. Um, it turned out that it's not necessarily only like that, so we found a larger network, at least for mines. I think you should, do this, you should have the same for your, where you work at. Uh, so we have people working in basic science, working for that, technology and cell biology. So taken together, applications of nanocarriers and cancer therapy is not an easy task. It's a complex task, um, because usually you will have IV injections with that. But by understanding the principles and the interactions in the biological surrounding, we will promote that field. And I think we have come, come, a far, we have come quite a far way. And when we look at immunology, how long it took in order really to make the, uh, to come to a patient's uh, effective treatment, I think we are still on a good way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. There is a question, right? You spend little time talking about diagnostics, and it is that we click in curing cancer, in my opinion. How so? Why, why did you not pay attention to diagnostic, which is very slow at present, and the limit in curing cancer? Yes, I would agree that diagnostic is, 
uh, is, is still something that we, we have not made, there no, were no new model, modalities coming up in diagnostics except for iron oxide particles. Um, I think we will still, we would, the, the progress there is in uh, next generation sequencing and uh, in these tools. Is that what you meant? In the liquid biopsies. Oh, in liquid biopsy, yes, yes, you're right. Donald, please. Um, your social question about translation, is there a generational effect? Do you see young doctors already having some training in nanomedicine who are more able to accommodate, if you like, your, the two sides of your crevasse? Uh, and is, is, is there an older generation that is, this is just something quite different? Or is this something more in the way people think than their training? Uh, well, I think the, what I see, at least for Germany, is uh, that we get more spe that we have more special, specialized uh, training um, for doctors, and if they pick up the scientific route in their training, uh, then they're always then they're also very uh, open to discuss new technologies and like uh, nanocarriers to treat uh, stuff like that. The olders, you're right. It, 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 for them, it sometimes just looks like a funny new idea, um, but I, I, I see at once they once they get something like a new drug, or they get an old drug like uh, doxorubicin in, in, in a new package, and they see well, it's different. It does different things. They are also uh, they are also convinced. So, final question from Gert. Uh, thank you for your talk. Apparently, you did uh, uh, detailed studies about uh, the number of polymer change on the surface in relation to corona and protein adsorption. We did similar things in the past with uh, pegylated liposomes. Mm -hmm. And we saw that with certain compositions, also in terms of the, uh, uh, let's say, the density of the pegylation, um, that we have increased amounts of proteins deposited. Uh, deposited on the on the liposome surface, so enhanced mm -hmm. adsorption because of pegylation. Uh, did you see similar observations? In our systems, we always had less, but it was something like we still find something like a third or a fourth of the uh, non-pegylated surfaces. But maybe, uh, yeah, I would be, I would so be happy to do the number and the, yeah, we uh, did we, we, and, we, did, we got and, up and in the brush the, and on everything, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So also lo looking for smaller chain lengths, long longer chain lengths, branched, uh, pegylated. When we got a high density, we got a lower absorption of proteins and we got a specific absorption of one protein only, or nearly one protein only. There's a question from Beard. No, no question. So thank you very much again. Thanks. For your talk.